Uh, if you were offering free hugs in 2019, that was seen as an empathic act. Um, right now in 2020, sociopathic. Uh, because as we are all fully cognizant, uh, we cannot avoid this virus, uh, either literally or metaphorically, uh, in any sector in which we work right now. And I think this cartoon sort of sums it up quite nicely. <clears throat> the aliens watching the goings on down here on planet Earth and going, wow, there seems to have been a coming together of many different threads of narrative. Uh, and for those of us like myself and Guy and other esteemed people like Anna Pollock on this call, who've been working on sustainability for 20 years or more, uh, it can feel like this perfect storm of, of a lot of the issues that we've been wrestling and wrangling with um, aligning in a new, very new, strange and urgent fashion. Uh, but it's not like we haven't had the warning signs. Um, you know, we've all seen the pictures of giant cruise ships cruising through the narrow canals of Venice, uh, which look equally incongruous, let alone when we start the impacts of the emissions uh, and the kind of the, the pouring out of people into cities which cannot cope with them. And if, if you like, this has been a kind of economic hijack of a shared resource by people who don't often uh, contribute or even care about the sustainability of the impacts that they unleash on the destinations that they purport to enjoy. Now, Guy and I and the rest of uh, GDSM crew were also involved in a piece of work earlier this year uh, with Copenhagen uh, in terms of destinations management. And Mikkel Arrow Hansen, the CEO of Wonderful Copenhagen, did a brilliant TEDx talk in January this year where he talked about how we use tourism as a resource in service to global transformation. So not this numbers game, which is somehow a race to the bottom uh, where everyone is trying to kind of slice off their own thin piece of the pie. But when actually we say, well, what is the global transformation we need and how do we build a tourism which serves that purpose? Rather than damage limitation uh, and the mitigation of incremental efficiency, but actually by design, by purpose, by intent. And that's what I want to just talk about this morning. Because as the poem illustrated, apocalypse is not the end of the world. It is actually about this drawing back of the veil. It's the revealing of things as they actually are. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and without referencing uh, Hamlet, um, all is not well in the state of tourism Denmark, or indeed the state of tourism um, around the world. Now, also, people have been talking about our current situation as an unimaginable future. And again, for futurists like myself, uh, who have been talking about the triple risk, if you like, of relatively unlikely events uh, and non-linear climate risk is one of those. Uh, we also have um, ec economic crises and global pandemics as the top three that we tend to talk about. Now we've got all three simultaneously. <clears throat> and as astronomer Royal Martin Rees uh, in the UK said, because of our interconnected world, and he said this in 2015, we would see an overwhelm of our health services even when the mortality rate or the fatality rate was a fraction of 1% of the population. So this is a, a very much imaginable future. And just to kind of illustrate that and round that point home, the All England Lawn Tennis Club that hosts the annual Wimbledon tennis tournament has for the last 17 years been quietly paying a million pound a year insurance premium against pandemics, which has just happily paid out a hundred million pound dividend. Now, Someone has had to make that argument at board level for the last 17 years is probably feeling quite smug right now um, in a slightly dark way because they've been vindicated of what was quite an expensive policy. <clears throat> but as I said, this is another coming up on the back of the Australian talking about end of the year, which devastated an area the size of Austria, burnt half a billion vertebrates displaced thousands of people, killed hundreds. And, you know, as someone said, you know, this is not climate change, it's just heat and drought. Ed, we have difficulties hearing you right now. Okay. Um, am I breaking up? I don't... Yes, you were breaking Maybe up. Switch. Can I... Shall I switch my video off? Yeah, let's switch. 
Is that better? Much Let's better. Try. That's Let's much try better. That okay. Presentation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You might have to just um, enjoy my images and imagine my gesticulations. Um, <laughs> The point I'm making here is that we're basically looking at tipping points where we get simple linear predictable trends turning into non-linear unpredictable uh, impacts and effects. In this case, in the Australian fires, we saw rising temperatures, droughts, winds and austerity cuts to fire and forestry services combining to create rapidly multiple spreading converging megafires that were literally out of control. And as Michael Mann, the climate scientist, said this is not in the models. And so that was before we saw the COVID uh, pandemic kick in. Uh, and I hesitate to quote Milton Friedman, but this quote is doing the rounds a lot at the moment because it is about the ideas we manage to keep alive during these periods of massive disruption, because those are the ideas that get picked up and carried forward. And I think what the GDSM is trying to do is to say we have some of the most effective and practical and thoughtful ideas already with us that we've been working on for a very long time that could now be implemented. Because we're all very familiar with the flattening of the curve in terms of the healthcare system capacity to bring down the cases of COVID-19 to within that carrying capacity. But equally, we could apply that same flattening the curve methodology and mentality to climate change and saying we have to get within our carrying capacity of the ecosystem because ultimately this is a series of waves which is coming at us. They're all interconnected and interdependent. COVID-19, if you like, is the training run. We now have an economic recession where in the UK, for example, we've lost 20% of our GDP uh, and, it, and the Greek crisis a few years ago was 10% of GDP just to put that kind of hit in context. And then we've got climate change coming up the rear, which is a by far bigger challenge, which is why I've been talking about it uh, in my podcast series with Dougal Hine, The Great Humbling, um, as some, this is a regrounding. This is a reconnection to the fundamentals of what really matters. And the thing is with a humbling, you have to acknowledge where you have made your mistakes and then try to move beyond the arrogance and hubris of the past into a more humble and open-hearted and open-minded future. Because I went around the world without flying, I wrote a book about it um, a dozen or so years ago, and air travel is still a massive component of this, but we were already seeing trends within our own industries uh, around air travel before COVID came in. Um, the idea of flig scam was on the rise, particularly amongst young people in the climate movement. And th that flight shaming, I don't think is going to go away. Plus, we also had a massive upsurge in the number of people wanting to make more sustainable travel choices, largely because of that climate challenge. And I think that will only become sharper um, as things develop. Because ultimately, when we start to look at our own sector and our own industry, we are seeing this kind of incredibly catastrophic effect. When you look at where we might have <clears throat> different shape recovery curves, whether it's V, U or L shaped. The fact is we are facing a kind of scorched earth type of scenario at the moment. <clears throat> I suspect what we're looking at is very much an L shaped recovery. Um, it's not going to be a rapid bounce back. It's not even going to be a smooth decline because we know in high contact type of industries like tourism and events and hospitality, it's not going to be the same. Anyone who's been to a pub in the UK this weekend will know that it doesn't feel like a pub. Um, you know, if you want to go to a high sanitation environment, you know, you go and visit your local uh, surgery, but um, you don't expect to have that in the context of the conviviality uh, of a pub. Um, and the longer this goes on, uh, the more likely we are to see longer lasting shifts in behavior change because people will adapt. We are an adaptable species and we will get used to a new normality um, beyond the other side of this crisis. Because the other thing that's worth noting is that this is going to be a very bumpy and long, slow recovery. We're already seeing this with new lockdowns, new localized lockdowns, Leicester in the UK, Melbourne in Australia. You know, people actually having to implement new lockdowns as we get spikes in cases and secondary waves, even if they're not national. Um, and so as we move on, we can see that this return to normal is not going to be easy or perhaps even desirable um, as we go forward. And, and there's a reason for that, because 
the dolphins in Venice might have been a sort of fantasy of the imagination, but the fact that they spread around the world as a viral news story speaks to something that people want to believe. The waters in the Venetian canals did clear with the lack of motor traffic, but what we want is to see uh, an end to this idea of over-tourism, this hyper-saturation uh, of specific venues and locations, which was already a highly contentious issue in places like Venice uh, and Barcelona and Amsterdam and others, uh, even before this crisis kicked in. So do we see this as a pause or a reset? Well, I think those of us who are trying to kind of build back to normal are completely misreading the potential of where we are right now. This, to me, speaks very profoundly to a sense of reset, because if our house has burnt to the ground, which, to be frank, in the hospitality and tourism um, sector, it frankly has, then do we build back the same house or do we build back a new house, the house of our dreams, the house we actually want, you know, rather than um, like crowbarring something out of the wreckage. This is about uh, the ashes being a fertile place for something new and fresh to regenerate and grow. Because we're even going to see restrictions within country, I believe. You know, local tourism is going to flourish. Um, speaking to a couple of people back in East Anglia, where I am right now, um, uh, holiday houses are saying their bookings are flat out through to October because people will be holidaying in the UK, not abroad this year. Obviously, people will be looking to the rural and remote. But what we're not going to see is a return to this normal. And then the other thing to note is that people see climate change as serious as a crisis as COVID-19. Uh, and on top of this particular poll from Ipsos Mori, there was another one in The Guardian last week which said that in the UK, only 6% of people want things to go back to whatever we might have called normal uh, before the crisis. Plus, you've got 93% of Barcelona tourism businesses remain committed to sustainability post-COVID. Uh, you know, destination sustainability is competitive. Um, as the benchmarking of the sustainability index has shown, you know, there is hopefully a virtuous race to the top. Um, and again, I'll reference the work of Anna Pollock here because it is this evolution, this inevitable um, awakening and stirring of consciousness, which takes us from this sort of machine-like instrumental approach to the world. And once you cross what she calls the ontological threshold to start to treat the world as a living system, then inevitably you have to engage with people and planet in a radically different way. Um, and it's not just, as I said, about maximizing shareholder value and damage limitation and the incremental world of efficiency by doing the same things slightly better. It is about doing radically different things and becoming a regenerative force for good. And that I think is where the real passion and potential of hopefully groups like ours gathering on this call starts to come from because Make no bones about it. There is all sorts of transformational change going on already. Um, we've already seen the things happening around remote working, the potential demise of the commute to work, as we might have already known it. The idea of actually reduced travel and the reduction of the hypermobility that we had before. We're seeing relocalization, um, particularly of food networks and, and food supply chains. There's a refocusing and reimagining, if you like, on what really matters. There may be a revisiting of ideas which might have been impractical or impossible in the past, but now we can make the politically impossible the politically irresistible, I believe. And then there's that overarching reframing as to what you know tourism is for. As I said, tourism in service to something bigger than itself, this global transformation. And finally, those last bits, it's about reconnecting to ourselves uh, and to our one and only lonely planet the reciprocity, the exchange that we can have with each other uh, and the wider natural world as we do that. And that leads us to this regenerative mindset. So all of this, this is just a, yeah, a list of some of the things that I've seen going on uh, in the last three months. And what we're, what we're hoping to build out of this, uh, again, and maybe Anna Pollock should have been doing this presentation, <laughs> but... Um, you know, this idea of this, what um, Ivan Illich would have called conviviality. You know, how do we learn from the wisdom and experience and expertise of nature? And how do we create real lasting human dy dynamism and relationships which are genuinely healthy? Because 
as the head of trade and export um, council in New Zealand said, the world is hunting for health, hunting for countries that care for their people and care for their environment, because that is where the ultimate desirability lies. Um, and, I, and I think it is a stark choice as we try and describe this regenerative movement which is emerging, which is we've already had the breakdown. As I said, the house is burnt. And now do we revert back to our change as usual, step-by-step -step type of process uh, of damage limitation, or do we break through? Do we see this as a once in a generational opportunity for the change that we truly desire and that we truly need? Because to think otherwise is a bit like, Darth Vader saying the construction of our, our new Death Star is an amazing job creation opportunity. Uh, you know, if we go back to normal, we know it was an industry which was not serving global transformation. If anything, it was impeding it. And so I always go back to Donatella Meadows, the great systems thinker, where she said the way that we change a system is not by tinkering with the parameters and the measures and the guides and the feedback loops which are actually the, the mechanics, if you like, it is actually about the intention and design that underpin that system. And so to have a goal of regeneration that transcends the existing paradigm, that gives us a new mindset about the way we think about our work uh, and what its ultimate purpose is, and then to change the goals and unleash, if you like, a devolved grassroots type of reimagination of tourism, uh, is where the real power lies. I mean, Extinction Rebellion have talked about this for the last two years, and I've been involved with some of their work around this idea of what a truly regenerative culture has to look like. Uh, and many people have been laying the foundations of this for, for a long time. But as XR have said, actually, really, only the impossible is interesting right now. You know, we have to be trying to stretch the imagination of the possible in ways we have not been able to do beforehand. Because I think to finish on to finish on a kind of a positive upbeat note, but with a kind of guarded uh, realism, is as they said in the civil rights movement in the 60s in America, as we've heard through the George Floyd protests around Black Lives Matter, but also equally in the context of climate change and the post-pandemic world that we are trying to finger spitz and gefool, you know, fingertip feel our way through, none of us are safe until all of us are safe. And so for me, and hopefully for us, the real opportunity of our careers, because I think we will all look back in 10 years time uh, with a critical eye on what we did at this extraordinary pivotal moment, because none of us are safe until all of us are safe. And this is where the power of a regenerative tourism and destination management industry could be our redemption. Thank you. Oh, Claudia, you're muted. So thank you, Ed, sorry, it's absolutely fantastic. And these thoughts really, as we can all sense already, they take us into a totally different realm where we are right now. And um, before we get add into questions, um, I just would like to add um, to the last slide, like none of us are safe until all of us are safe. And this is exactly the transformation that is being described right now also very nicely by Otto Sharma from our ego system that we are into ecosystem thinking. And so with this, I would like to um, take it into, into, into questions, into the audience. And we would love to have some questions for Ed or, or, or remarks or ideas which you would like to have uh, for his presentation. So please un unmute yourself and, and go ahead. So who would like to say some, who would like to ask us something? Yes, Ed, please try video again. We want to see you, of course. I have one, if I, I jump in first. Yes, Guy, please go ahead and so, kick so off. Ed, Ed, you work in 
in lots of industries, not just tourism events. Um, what's kind of filling you up with, uh, or, or with hope and inspiration at the moment? What are you, you seeing? What are you working on? You think really this is kind of game changing stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think I, and that, that's a really good question because as you say, I have, a, I have fingers in lots of pies and toes in lots of camps. Um, I mean, starting in, in tourism, I think, you know, it's this connection back to deeper purpose. And I think, you know, we've had, a, we've had 10 years perhaps of what we might call purpose posturing, where, you know, there's been some good examples of organizational and sectoral purpose, which have real uh, solid foundations. But I think a lot of it has been organizations going, how do we retrofit a purpose onto what we currently do, which makes us sound acceptable? Um, and I think what we're now seeing is people having to go back to it. I mean, the, the example of Airbnb, which has become, as we all know, an engine that eats cities, you know, it's completely lost touch with its original purpose, which was in many ways that conviviality that I described from Ivan Illich. It was like, how do we have an authentic human experience by sharing and staying in a stranger's house? in a city that they, or a destination they know and love. And the essence of that purpose is really powerful. But Airbnb became a monstrous marketization engine, which actually completely destroyed its original purpose. And I think the CEO of Airbnb admitted that pretty much and said, you know, we've, we've completely lost that. And we need to try and reconnect back to it. And I think that's happening in all sorts of sectors with people saying, what are we for? You know, and I think you've also got uh, an agitated population who is also asking that question. You know, what are you adding to the essentials of my life? How are you looking after the system that supports me, the system workers, the key workers? And we've seen, again, we'll see lots of posturing going on as everyone trying to desperately piggyback their own virtue uh, on the back of health workers, um, you know, or care home workers or, you know, the fund del delivery drivers even who have kept the whole show on the road over the last few months. So I, I think the thing that really gives me hope is the organisations actually having to take a step back and going, well, why do we exist and how do we justify what we do? And what other things have we got sat in our portfolio of activity that might actually be the lifeboats if this main vessel of our organization is, is going to go down. And um, Ed, I would like to add to this one quickly, this, this why do we exist? Uh, I think this can be really at a going deeper, like from a place or destination to really ask, why are we here? I mean, just imagine whatever in a Caribbean, I'm just taking like this example, why do like a Caribbean island which lives on tourism who comes for bathing and now with no COVID or with climate change coming. So, so then to get back to the roots and asking really, why do we exist? Why are we here? Is our DNA the beach tourism? Just to give a, to be a rough example. So I just wanted to add on that one that, that I totally also see that. Any other questions, please? And, and add another question, what in, in all of this, so, so um, what do you think will uh, be needed um, uh, as key attributes for, um, for, for leadership of leaders? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, that's why I try, I think this is, this is a personal piece. That's why I was trying to finish at the end, um, you know, on what will, we, what will we regret if we look back? You know, most of us here, I imagine, are at the peak of our careers in some way. You know, we've, um, we're at our, our moment where we're hoping to deliver our biggest impacts. Um, and I, I think, you know, to look back with regret in 10 years' time could be a very, very bitter pill. So I think the qualities and the attributes that are going to be needed are this empathy to understand where um, others are coming from but also to have some courage, because this is stepping into some unknown territory, mm -hmm. and it is stepping into some uncertainty, because we are not going to build back better on the frameworks and the basis of what came before. 
Mm-hmm. And it takes courage to step into that uncertainty, mm-hmm. to do what is right, mm-hmm. because when we are threatened and when we are facing risk, our instinct is to go back to the familiar, is to actually regress and retrench what worked before, what do we know, what won't I get into trouble for doing? Um, and that is just not going to cut it right now. So mm-hmm. I think it's empathy. I think it's courage. Um, but also I think it's about how to build the most unusual partnerships. You know, it's that ability to connect and work with the unexpected partners. Um, because that again, is I think where the emergent stuff will come from, what will be the most unusual bedfellows to be getting together? Because as my fellow futurist, uh, Mark Stevenson always says, he goes, people are split around political ideologies but they're often united around projects. Now, if we can find the transformative, regenerative tourism potential and build collaborations and partnerships uh, across multiple sectors around those ideas, then we will hopefully begin to transcend some of the political differences, which often still divide us. Um, and, I, and I think so. Th- those are the three things I would say. It's like it's the empathy, it's the courage, and then it's the ability to connect and build collaborations. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Melissa. Yes, um, it's wonderful, absolutely sensational, very, very inspirational. Um, I'm talking from a South African context here because I'm watching basically our entire. Um, tourism industry being eradicated and eradicated on very, very unsound political reasoning. So you speak about leadership and you speak about courage. I'm, you know, long history, over 15 years, deeply immersed in this, in this narrative. Um, I'm a writer and a strategist, so I'm very focused on what new words we can bring into the narrative because as we've had all this um, purpose posturing that you speak of. Mm. Uh, There's loads and loads of opportunities, but where are we going to be able to out strategize the politics that is degrading our very ability to envisage or envisage a new future? I mean, I would just love your personal perspective. I mean, I'm very much of, of Buckminster Fuller's thinking, you don't fight an old system, you recreate something. Yeah. So that, I mean, I must say, this has been the first time in the last four months that I've actually felt really inspired. <laughs> <laughs> so I found my people again. Thank you. Yay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I'm like, yes, let's go do it. Let's go own it. Let's, let's do it because now I'm, I'm reactivated. But we've got some scary political monsters to overcome. So... And I, uh, Melissa, I would, you know, I'd be lying if I said there was a simple and easy answer to that yeah. Yeah, tricky question. But if I was to offer a personal perspective on that, you know, this goes way back. My original career was as a marine biologist. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I started out from an ecological perspective. Um, and one of the issues in marine fisheries, for example, it's what I used to work on, um, mm. was the tragedy of the commons. Um, mm. And I th- and that's a very misinterpreted philosophical um, point. But the mm. issue is, is that the public goods, and I touched on it in the talk, the public goods that are the core of our tourism are finite resources. And they are currently exactly. being, being monetized by people who do not have um, a direct relationship with the reinvestment and the protection and conservation mm. of those finite Um, resources and so I think somehow we have to regain that idea of the collective because and that's where it comes that's where I think you know we align with the climate message and we align as I say that's why I think none of us are safe until all of us are safe because Mm. you know no one is the only people winning at the moment are the investors in the previous kind of tourism model because the, the tourists themselves are getting an increasingly degraded experience my partners yes. from my partners from Liguria uh, in northern Italy, you know. So, and everyone knows Cinque Terre is a kind of classic example of a place where you know the residents aren't benefiting. You know, it's like the cruise ships are spilling thousands of people into these places every day, and you're looking at it just going, 
how did this abomination, you know, evolve? And the mm. thing is, I think part of it is, this is where the empathy piece comes in, is I, I'm not sure anyone goes at this with an intention of destroying something. Yeah, well, intention one hopes. <laughs> hopes. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have to be lightly, slightly, oh, because yes. I would like to pass also the work on to you. Oh, okay, well, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Wonderful, okay. The last question More that I take is from Louise. She has been raising her hand, so please, Louise, go ahead. Yes, um, I wanted to kind of raise something that I've been um, struggling with because I was very happy with um, Ed's presentation and kind of the hope that radiates from it. But something that I've been struggling with is that we, the people who are in this call, are, if I generalize, in quite a privileged position where we can have the opportunity and the safety to be thinking about what are we doing, who are we, what do we want to achieve. Um, but because of the, the COVID situation that we're in now, a lot of people are basically trying to survive, um, which makes it maybe harder to think about those, um, those things, individual people, individual businesses. So that's what, what I was wondering. How do we support the people who don't have the mind space or anything else to be able to think those things because that's something that I sometimes struggle with what, what we've been doing at Visit Flanders as well we have the opportunity and the capacity to think about this but some people don't for some people this is life and death and survival and, and bread on, on the table um, so that's just something I wanted to put out there as a major challenge I would think. Yeah no I think Louise you're completely right I mean I think we have to you know when you look at it from a global perspective I mean, there was a very, very interesting piece um, in The Guardian a couple of weeks ago about the end of tourism, where they were talking a lot about um, Indonesia and Kenya. Um, and there were some great examples in there of, of how, you know, you know, we're really wrestling and wrangling with that reality on the ground. Um, and, you know, and the, the kind of the classic example uh, of eco and conservation tourism of the, the, the lowland gorillas, you know, in Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda and Uganda was also mentioned because clearly those communities have now built up a very key support and, and economic infrastructure around some very high spend, high end tourism. You know, so it's not only the gorillas that are endangered, but you know, the, the people there have suddenly had all of their revenues cut off. I don't, I don't, again, I don't think there are simple answers to this, but in, in a way tourism can often be used as a, as a very rapid, sticking plaster because it's seen as a very easy quick way of generating jobs and economic growth um that swift solution as i think we all appreciate in a world of change travel and a long slow bumpy recovery is not an option anymore so i think we have to think deeper um about you know i, I can imagine a world actually where there's a lot more online tourism and online connection with these special places um again through a sense of empathy it was like wanting to look up in the same way that people have donated you know millions hundreds of millions of, of dollars to saving whales when they may never see a whale in their life but they know that the existence and the protection and the vicarious value of the whale to be protected is hugely important to them now i can i can imagine a, a tourism world where we have a, 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 a almost a kind of thing a, a virtual tourism where we're helping to try and protect the communities and the people who live alongside those those species of those places um in a way that we don't necessarily have to drag uh, our our well-fed bottoms there personally 